uh, in the third session uh, from, uh, from Dr. Francisco Sarisco Okwa. Before he present his presentation, I would like to read about his curriculum vitae. He studied medicine in the National Autonomous University of Mexico. He did both his Master of Science in Immunology and his PhD in Transplantation Tolerance and Immunoregulation at Imperial College London. He also worked in internal medicine at the Royal London and Bath Hospital obtaining his NRCP UK. He did his specialization in nephrology at the Singapore General Hospital where he worked for 10 years as a nephrologist. Currently, he is a nephrologist and transplant immunologist practicing at Francisco Kidney and Medical Center in Singapore. Focusing on general nephrology, kidney transplantation, diabetic kidney disease, diabetes prevention, including weight loss. Dr. Francisco has several international publications and has been invited for several oral presentations in different countries, including UK, Mexico, Switzerland, Malaysia, Spain, and Singapore. Okay, doctor, take your time. Thank you for your kind introduction. Thank you for coming uh, today. Um, I hope this talk is informative. Let's start. The, do the dose of dialysis to keep patient alive for one year is not the same dose to keep him well for one year. You might be thinking that I'm going to discuss an update on dialysis adiposine. However, this relates very well to diabetic kidney disease and you will learn. So just keep this statement in your mind. Diabetes is taking over the world. It is expected that in 2040, 642 million people will have diabetes. And it is one of the top causes of death and disability worldwide. In Singapore, it is expected that in 2050, one million of Singaporeans will have diabetes. If you take into account that there is only five to six million of Singaporeans currently, so this figure is very impressive. Also in Singapore, one in nine people have diabetes, but only one out of three know it. And from those that have diabetes, only one out of three controls it properly. So all the complications can happen in these patients. Diabetic kidney disease parallels also the increment in diabetes. 40% of the people with diabetes will develop diabetic kidney disease. Diabetic kidney disease increases the cardiovascular risk in patients and the risk for death. It is the, indeed the most common cause of kidney failure worldwide. And patients on diabetes who develop kidney failure, they live a shorter lifespan and a life with many complications. So I hope I made case for this presentation with that information. So I'm going to give you an update on diabetic kidney disease, focusing on the glycemic control and lifestyle. So uh, as I'm Dr. Francisco, um, I have declared a war against diabetes. Besides being a nephrologist, so I'm also an active promoter of health focusing on diabetes prevention and early detection. This is my disclaimer. I have no academic or commercial affiliation with Pulses. Um, I receive no fee for presenting this lecture, but I thank them for the kind invitation. So some definitions before we start the talk. The terms of normal albuminuria, microalbuminuria, and macroalbuminuria are obsolete already. We need to use the terms of no albuminuria or lack of albuminuria when the albuminuria per day is zero to 30 milligrams. When it is 31 to 300, use the term of album, uh, moderately increased albuminuria. And when it's over 300, severely increased albuminuria. But we can use the terms of over diabetic nephropathy or clinical grade proteinuria. What are the stages of diabetic kidney disease? 
we have first the glomerular hypertension caused by hyperglycemia. Then the silent stage, no one knows where there is damaging going on, but it's already happening. And then incipient nephropathy when you can detect it with some markers. And then it becomes more impressive, end up in end stage kidney disease. I'm going to just show you three slides on the pathology. Later, I will present a workshop on pathology. So this is normal glomerulus. You can see the glomerular sclerosis um, in the diabetic kidney. You can see the increment in the matrix. So obviously, this glomerulus is not going to perform its function very well. Again, it's more severe, the glomerular sclerosis. You can see also high line in the arteriole. This is an electron micrograph. This is the normal GBM. You see nightly the pedicels of photocytes, you know, the fenestrated endothelial cells. For in diabetes, the GBM is thickened. Thicker doesn't mean better. On the contrary, it's worse. So the pathogenesis of diabetic kidney disease is well established. You know, there is non enzymatic glycosylation of many proteins and many tissue components. Um, overproduction of these so-called advanced glycosylation end products, or age. The age act on rage in the kidney disease. The cells have got receptors for this age. This activate, cause dysfunction in the cells, for example, the endothelium, cause endothelial dysfunction, are linked to arterial stiffness and many other problems, inflammation, oxidative stress, that are important damaging situations for the endothelium. And as you know, diabetes is a vascular disease, yeah? Hyperglycemia in the glomerulus cause increased production of mesangial matrix, glycation of the matrix products and cross linking on collagen and mesangial cell apoptosis. This is not beneficial for the structure or the function of the glomerulus. More importantly, this is responsive to glycemic control. Hyperglycemia also reduce nephrine expression and cause impaired signaling on both sides insulin receptor. There is also intraglomerular hypertension induced by the renal vasodilation and consequent glomerular hyperfiltration and damage to the uh, endothelial cells of the glomerulus. But again, this is responsive to RAS blockade. When you give ACE inhibitors or angiotensin receptor blockers to patients, so you prevent the angiotensin II mediated constriction of the efferent arteriole, so you release the pressure and re release the injury, the hydrostatic injury to the endothelium, and the patient benefits. You might drop a little bit the GFR, but that redu reduction of pressure is beneficial in the long run. Also, as I mentioned in, the, in that micrograph, there is arterial hyalinosis. This causes ischemia, so the whole nephron suffers, the glomerulus, and also the, the rest of the tubules contributing to the damage. What are the markers and manifestations of diabetic kidney disease? The GFR and albuminuria are the, the main markers. As I mentioned before, the damage starts earlier before you can detect this. Later, the presentations will be proteinuria, progressive kidney dysfunction, and hematuria, especially when it's advanced uh, glomerular sclerosis. But then, let's talk about proteinuria a little bit. In type 1 diabetes, 20 to 30% of them develop moderately increased albuminuria at around 15 years, and less than half will progress to overt nephropathy. But again, importantly, this can regress to no albuminuria or remain stable with good glycemic control, blood pressure control, and RAS blockade. This study from Sweden also demonstrates that it takes around 25 years for type 1 diabetics to now develop overt nephropathy. But again, with better glycemic control, there are less chances that the patient develops over nephropathy. The 
diabetes control and complications trial, epidemiology of diabetes interventions and complications study, demonstrated that by 10 years with glucosamine control, 50% of the patients regress to moderately increased proteinuria and a proportion to norbuminuria. Some of them progress to CKD3 and a few to end stage kidney disease. But again, better glycemic control and blood pressure control was beneficial. In type 2 diabetes, there are many studies in many group, uh, ethnic groups, but overall the rates are similar. And again, good glycemic control and RAS blockade are beneficial. But let me just go into more detail into the, into the United Kingdom prospective study. This is the novel diabetic patients at 10 years, 25% had already moderately increased albuminuria, 5% severely increased albuminuria, and around 1% creatinine over once, 75 or even end stage kidney disease. So what was the median time duration for the patient moved from one stage to another? It took 19 years from, to move from no albuminuria to moderately increase albuminuria, around 11 years to move from severely increased albuminuria, and then around 10 years to increase the creatinine to this level. But it only takes 2.5 years to develop any stage when the creatinine is above this level. These figures are impressive, although you can say only 1% of diabetics will develop any stage, because diabetes is so common, it's a small proportion, but a huge amount of people will develop diabetic kidney disease and, and um, end stage. And this is disastrous for the patient and disastrous for the healthcare system because treating diabetes is very taxing, very expensive. But also tells you that it only requires 2.5 years on, on median time to develop end stage once your creatinine is 175. And how many of us have many patients on creatinine over this figure, yeah? But the good thing, again, is that this can be minimized with good glycemic control and RAS blockade. Because we're talking about manifestation, let's just uh, take a, a um, parenthesis to talk about the relationship between diabetic kidney disease and retinopathy. In type one diabetics, usually when they have diabetic kidney disease, they already have retinopathy and neuropathy. Retinopathy typically precedes diabetic kidney disease, but the converse is not true. Many type one diabetics with retinopathy don't have diabetic kidney disease. This sounds a little bit complex, but what happens is first they develop um, retinopathy and then nephropathy. So if you see a patient with retinopathy, he might not have yet the nephropathy. But if you see a patient with nephropathy, usually already have the retinopathy. In type two diabetics, it's not so predictable. Around 50 to 60% of the patients have diabetic kidney disease and retinopathy. But when they have proteinuria and retinopathy, most likely that proteinuria is due to diabetic kidney disease. To make it simpler, the Kedoki in 2007 just stated that if proteinuria and retinopathy are present, diabetes is the most likely diagnosis. But proteinuria present, but no retinopathy in diabetic patients, then you should exclude another cause of the proteinuria. So then we come to the question when to investigate further. So if you are a nephrologist, this is the question that you should ask yourself. If you are in the audience a uh, GP or other specialist, then the question is when to refer to a nephrologist, correct? So let's just go through it. When the onset of proteinuria is less than five years from the onset of type one diabetes, because remember it was like around 15 years, so it's too fast, so there might be something else going on. This is not totally uh, you know, exact for type two diabetes for what I mentioned before, when there is acute onset of the disease, when this rapid progression of, of the EFR decline or increment of creatinine, especially after start, starting RAS blockade, 
when there is hematuria of this morphic nature, and there is red blood cell cast, because most likely it's an inflammatory hormonephritis, when there is no retinopathy or neuropathy in type 1 diabetes, for remember this is not so exact for type 2 diabetes, um, when there are seeing signs or, and symptoms of systemic disease like lupus, or when there is full-blown nephrotic syndrome, the patient might have heavy proteinuria, but doesn't have hypovolemia, severe leg edema, so most likely uh, that might concur with diabetes. But if indeed it has got the full-blown nephrotic syndrome, most likely it will be a primary glomonephritis. What are the risk factors for diabetic kidney disease? They are the non-modifiable, like age, family predisposition, race, but the modifiable, like hyperfiltration, high blood pressure, worse glycemic control, smoking, and, and many others, yeah? So, what are the risk factors that we can tackle? Glycemic control, antihypertensive medications, RAS blockade, modification of habits, low protein diet. So from the rest of my presentation, this is going to be kind of my map. Uh, let's start with glycemic control. That is one of the treatment goals for, the, uh, for diabetic kidney disease, yeah? Why? Because glycemic control can reverse glomerular hypertrophy and hyperfiltration, can retard the development of proteinuria or worsening of it, can reduce or stabilize proteinuria, and can slow the progression of GFR decline, as I mentioned some of the studies already, yeah? So, but le let me show you some evidence. In type 1 diabetes, good glycemic control, as you can see, in an intensive glycemic control compared to conventional, reduce the percentage of patients having moderately increased proteinuria. In the trial I mentioned before, intensive glycemic control in type 1 diabetics produced the reduction of albuminuria, the new onset of CKD was reduced, and hypertension. And this benefit was sustained for up to 20 years after the conclusion of the trial. In the advanced trial, also on glycemic control in type 2 diabetics, there was reduction of albuminuria, 50% reduction in the incidence of end stage kidney disease, and, but the benefit also sustained around 10 years after the conclusion of the trial. But also to receive, for example, this benefit, you need to have glycemic control for a long period of time, around 10 years or so. So it's just like eating salad, you know? You don't eat salad for one week or one weekend and you think that you will receive the benefit. You need to eat it for long term. But there is a pay, to, um, um, a price to pay that is the hypoglycemic risk. Because especially people with diabetes and CKD are more prone to develop hypoglycemia because insulin and many of the oral drugs accumulate because of the decreased GFR. Also, the patients have some deficient gluconeogenesis, and there is some dissociation between the HB1C and hypoglycemic events, and other factors as well. The ACCORD trial showed that hypoglycemia in the intensive glycemic control arm was associated with increased mortality. So no wonder many people get scared, patients, doctors, and we started probably a cushion on hyperglycemia, allowing the patient to get a little more hyperglycemic, but potentially playing also uh, the, um, you know, more complications. Also patients by themselves, they are allowed to be on the hyperglycemic uh, side because hypoglycemia is very bad, no? Patient can basically die, you know, acutely. So that's why it's very important. And indeed, when we monitor patients, the first priority is to try to minimize and try to identify hypoglycemia and revert to euglycemia. But I will show you that that one can be achieved. With an individualized and careful glycemic control while targeting hypoglycemic points and minimizing hypoglycemic dips. With a better monitoring, a more detailed monitoring of glycemic control. Let me discuss just some of the ways we monitor glycemia in diabetic patients. Fasting glucose and pre-meal glucose, 
are commonly used, but they don't reflect the post-mill uh, glucose excursions nor hypoglycemic events. The HB1C is a good method for glucose exposure, but also does not reflect the hypoglycemic events. There are newcomers like glycated albumin and others. I will comment a little bit about this one. But ambulatory glucose monitoring is becoming the gold standard for diabetes, and I will talk briefly about that. Let's talk about HB1C in CKD and end-stage disease. As the disease progresses, and even in end-stage kidney disease, the erythrocytes live shorter, and there is more turnover. So there is the HB1C and the glucose don't correlate very well. There is a lower HB1C for the same level of high glucose. So because, especially this is worse when there is correction of anemia with EPO and iron. So just let me rephrase that. Because there is a lot of turnover of erythrocytes for, for the uremia and all the correction with these drugs. So the hemoglobin turnover is faster. So there is not so much time for becoming glycated. So it's kind of falsely lower. So one uh, author called Mark Mollis in Mexico last year estimated that it's around 1% lower than the real. So let's say if you measure your, your uh, HB1C in one patient with dialysis, probably is nine, but the realistic might be 10, yeah? So it's what, what this author mean. The glycated albumin is one of the newcomers. It's not affected by anemia. It's not affected by GFR changes. However, is it, it is affected by proteinuria. So it's heavy proteinuria. So it's the same, again, a rapid turnover of the albumin, so no sufficient time to be glycated. So it might underrepresent the real glucose exposure for the patients. But now, let me just, uh, I'm just going to show you this slide on ambulatory glucose profile. Probably this is one of the ways to go. If you know ambulatory glucose profile is um, a way to monitor continuously glycemia. You measure the sugar day and night for up to 14 days, and then you generate this sort of plot that is the summary of all the data got during 14 days put in a you know a screen that is the whole day from you know from midnight to midnight and show the medium and some spread plots is kind of the summary of the patient it's like a, some people call it an ECG but it's more like a halter or a 24 hour profession monitoring yeah so when you are you know monitoring your blood pressure the 24 hour blood pressure monitoring gives you more information correct so a hotel gives you more information than an ECG. So definitely these give you more information than just fasting glucose or HbA1c, which are just a static uh, measurement. This is a dynamic measurement. So but let me put this example why it's also clinically useful. This is a patient with diabetes. This, I attended a course. Uh, um, basically, this patient, if I recall it fine, have insulin, like I think it's a type of mixture, or, and then it has got, you know, it's hyperglycemic because this is the target range, very hyperglycemic, even all, because very high the, the sugars here, but there are many dips here below the, the target range. So meaning that this patient on average is at risk of hyperglycemia four times during the day. And this is just this, this, the, this, uh, shadows represent only the 80% of the data. So meaning there are even lower data here. So this patient is at high risk. So once the patient was modified, so the focus was on hypoglycemia, the insulin was reduced rather than increased, lifestyle modifications. So the next plot in the next visit, you know, is still hyperglycemic according to the medium has not changed but now the hypoglycemia disappeared by reducing the insulin and some lysa modifications, yeah? And then 
After that, the focus was now to try to reduce the hyperglycemia, and the plot now is within range, almost normal, <laughs> and also the medium is very stable, not compared like, like here. I think this, uh, the battery died. Uh, you cannot see properly, never mind. So um, in the top, you say it's very hyperglycemic. In here, um, it's too bad. So in here is now almost euglycemic. But one of the important things is, so it's a stepwise process, but one of the important things is that if you were to measure HB1C in this patient at these two points, this HB1C will probably be the same. But we won't tell you that the patient is at high risk for hyperglycemia. It will be a high HB1C. Also, if the patient, if you measure just the fasting glucose, it will be high, correct? So what will be your reflex response, your normal reflex response, will be to increase the insulin in this patient. So what will happen if you increase the insulin in this patient, if he's already suffering for severe hypoglycemia, you will worsen, the patient will end up in hospital and something worse. But you will be only able to reveal that with the glucose monitoring. So that's one of the, also another important things that you can identify with this. So indeed, the hypoglycemic risk is very important and is the focus, the main focus as these photos did here. But now you can do more. So you can probably reduce the risk and still try to achieve glucose control, but you need more information. And this system is not available in many countries, but it's becoming slowly available. This system gives you a lot of information to manage to be able uh, you know, to manage your patients better, to so they can achieve better outcomes. And in this, by using this system, it has been demonstrated that patients are more likely to be in target with better HbA1c and better quality of life, at least. Okay. So I just copy and paste this statement from also from that conference from from Mark Mollich. He was wondering why to monitor diabetic control in patients with diabetic um, kidney disease and end stage, and if does diabetic control make a difference for the patient with advanced CKD and end stage? And it was my personal view. I'm just putting it here because I concur with him. Also, he's got the same view. Indeed, I show that there is some benefit on end stage, but if the patient is already in stage. There are many studies that have not shown benefit of cardiovascular outcomes on death, but that's not all the things that matters to patients or, or should matter to doctors. There's also the quality of life, because indeed, maybe the patient already had end stage, but if you improve the glycemic control, you can prevent to develop other complications, maybe remain you know, happier, in, independent, free from blindness, you know, because still we live 10 years plus on dialysis. If he's hyperglycemic, he still will all the organs will affect or even develop amputations. So it still has good, uh, it's good to control the patient well in any stage. It's more complex, but the ambulatory glucose profile gives you an advantage to try to do that. So that's why um, I started this talk with this statement, the dose of dialysis to keep a patient alive for one year is not the same dose to keep him well for one year. I read this many years ago when I was in training in a dialysis book. It hooked my mind because it's real. So we are in trials and we just focus on, on survival. That is very important. Obviously, everyone wants to live as long as, as long as possible, but also wants to live a good life, so to enjoy life, not just uh, you know to have a lot of complications. So the same principle applies to diabetes. The level of glycemic control to keep a patient alive is not the same level of glycemic control to keep him free of disabilities. So that's why I started. And this applies, I, this statement applies to many aspects of you know, medicine, not only diabetes or, or dialysis or renal failure, yeah? So I will give another funny, shocking statement when running, what is the most important thing? To <laughs> run with Adidas, Nike, Reebok, Generics? You might think, oh, now I was going to talk about an update on sports shoes. What do you think? Which one would be 
the best. No shoes. Uh, no shoes. That's another option. I, I'll comment on that option later. But let, let's see. Okay, let me just go through the talk and then we will try to see if we concur with, the, um, with our answer. So, but also this relates to diverticinesis as you will see. So let's, let me give you some brief notes on the use of hypoglycemics in diabetic kidney disease. The important thing on hypoglycemics is that with the decreased GFR, basically most of them is to be reduced, yeah? Metformin is to be reduced to avoid lactic acidemia. Some of the glitins need to be reduced as well. SGL2, LT2 um, inhibitors have reduced efficacy. G LP1 agonists, you know, sometimes need to be reduced, or side effects like GI effects are more common when the patient has got CKD or can interact with loop diuretics, that is a common prescription for CKD patients. Saponeurias are highly associated with hypoglycemia, and many authors recommend this continuation. Um, insulins also accumulate because the kidney <coughs> degrades the insulin, so usually patients need reduction of the dose. This is just a, a slide, you know, flowing online on the safety periods for anti uh, anti-glycemics, or was also presented in, in that conference in Mexico uh, by a Mexican author. Basically, you can use insulin throughout the, the stages of CKD. Here doesn't represent, uh, is, uh, any stage is not represented here, but it tells you what medications you try to avoid. But at the end, you need to individualize to the patient as well. But let's talk about metformin. Basically, the main worry is the risk of metabolic acidosis. And the GFR that is permissive is trying not to use it below 30. It's what most people uh, you know, concur. It's even up to date recommend that. So I think it's, 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 it's a good recommendation. But you know, Mark Gebro also in this Congress in Mexico last, last year uh, presented this research, I'm not going to go through the details but for the sake of time, but what he found is probably a sort of a recommendation on the dose of metformin according to the GFR. For CKD 3A, 500 milligrams in the morning and 100 milligrams at night, a total of 1.5 grams. For CKD, CKD 3B, one gram total, and for CKD4, probably able to use still 500 milligrams for it. So you don't need to use this. It's just one of the recommendations, because if you also use blindly, you might encounter problems. So, but he also tells you how to use it properly if you want to go below. So I'm not going to tell you to go to this dose. I will probably safely tell you, just consider maximum till this level. But if you decide to go to this dose because you still believe metformin will be very beneficial for this patient, then he gives you the formula. I will present in a minute. But indeed, there are other substitutes, you know, if you, especially if your patient, you cannot monitor him very well, lives distant, et cetera, no? But let's go through his formula. It's based on the lactate. So he basically, his patients, he measured the lactate. If it was above 2.5, he didn't give at all the the, the metformin. And then if he was, if he was below 2.5, so he started, you know, uh, the metformin and measured the lactate every three months for the first year. And if at any time point of those measurement points, the lactate was above five, definitely to stop. If it was above 2.5 or below five, just adjust the dose of the metformin and recheck in one month's time. If again, the reading was above 2.5 to stop. And if you were able to continue the metformin, just con monitor the GFR in CKD3 every three months or CKD4 every, th uh, every three months, sorry. Uh, every six months for CKD3 and every uh, three months for CKD4 if you decide to do it. So to eventually go back to this table. But I told you, just take with caution this, especially if you cannot measure like the levels, if you cannot monitor the patients closely for whatever reason. Um, so, linagliptin and some of the glitins have been also shown to reduce proteinuria. 
I'm just going to flash some of these slides, like the Marlina uh, study showed that patients with nagliptin also uh, did not have less proteinuria. Now there are other uh, trials like Carmelina trying to look for renal outcomes, etc. So we wait for the results. The sodium glucose cotransporter inhibitors are becoming in fashion because they have cardiovascular benefits, but also they improve uh, hyperglycemia, obviously because they are uh, glycosuric, um, can induce loss of body weight, promote naturesis, good for blood pressure control as well. Uh, for example, the Cantata SUR trial shows renal protection. The EMPA-RESH outcome trial um, with empa glyphosine so cardiovascular risk reduction also slow the progression of diabetic uh, or kidney disease because they can um, reduce the glomerular pressure by you know enhancing the constriction of the peripheral artery also less blood less pressure so protection to the glomerular endothelium yeah Insulin needs to be adjusted as well. So also, this is just a recommendation. It's not a, a rule that you need to follow, but what you just need to take uh, home is that indeed consider that reduction of insulin for your patients as the GFR drops. It is, this author, this Mexican doc, uh, nephrologist, showed that maybe by uh, stage 3B reduced by 30%, stage 4 by 50, stage 5 by, by 60%. But again, you individualize to the patient because especially in any stage, there are many factors uh, you know, affecting the, the glycemia, like malnutrition because of the uremia, or exposure to high glucose like, like, like PDE, fluids, etc. So you just need to monitor and individualize this treatment for your patients. So now let's try to answer the question, when running, what is the most important thing? Running with Adidas, Nike, Reebok, generics, uh, as I told you, it relates to this topic. So actually, it is just running. As you, as you sir, commented, can be bare food. So, but the benefit is by you keep moving, that you run. Maybe some of them are lighter, fancier, more ankle support, less shock, you know, in fashion. But at the end, the clue is that you start running. You start making your heart, your muscles work. So indeed, if you have some, you know, you want to protect with, uh, you know, your knees, maybe using one that have give you more cushion is better. So still you can individualize, but at the end of the day is the, you receive the benefit by running. So I can ask you the question. So for glycemic control, what is the most important thing? It is glycemic control with metformin, DDP4, SGL2, you know, GLP-1, serpinureas, diet, is again the same answer. It is just achieving good glycemic control. Maybe some patients will benefit more from metformin, other patients from another drug, but that's why you individualize your treatment. But again, the secret is not just one, the fashion drug for, for every patient. Uh, I have patients, starting with HbA1c type 2 diabetic, with HbA1c 12.5, and just with the shock of their lives, very motivated through diet, the HbA1c 5.7. Just pure diet, refuse even insulin. You will have to do it with insulin, metformin. The patient opted for diet only, and it worked very well. So at the end of the day, the secret is on the diet. And all these medications work better if the patient improves the diet, because it's less sugar to bring down, correct? Um, because of sake of time and because my focus of this presentation is on glycemic control, I'm not going to mention anything about antihypertensive medications and RAS blockade. Actually, I, I presented a talk on that a couple of weeks uh, here in Singapore as well, focusing on this aspect. But because of sake of time, I'm going to skip this. Apologize for the inconvenience. But I'm going to focus now on modification of bad habits and also a little bit of low protein diet because this is very related with glycemic control, yeah? For that reason and because it's important for patients and sometimes is leave left behind. So let's talk about lifestyle modifications for prevention of diabetic kidney disease. 
Let's talk about weight reduction and exercise. Can improve glycemia, can lower the blood pressure, can reduce albuminuria. It seems to be that the magical number is 4% to receive those benefits. But indeed, with 5% loss, on average, you have a lot of metabolic benefits. But 10% weight loss is actually therapeutic. You can revert even occasionally diabetes. You can, re uh, if it's mild, you can revert fatty liver. So, but the minimum dose is 4% to receive those benefits. This control of this lipidemia is also important. For example, with the statins, the progression of the American disease can be diminished, especially there's more damage when the cholesterol is above 5.7 because hyperlipidemia contributes to glomerular sclerosis because also damage, damaging the endothelium. All of these are vascular disorders, hypertension, dyslipidemia, you know, um, diabetes. In this, the use of phenofibrate also have positive effects in, in patients with type 2 diabetes in the diabetes atherosclerosis intervention study. For example, compared to placebo, in the post hoc analysis, the worsen, worsening of protein urea was less with phenofibrate. Salt restriction is important as a lifestyle measurement because also reduces blood pressure, reduces albuminuria, and enhances the effect of the RAS blockade. The magical number is a restriction of around 70 ml equivalents per day. But that is too restrictive, so most patients won't follow it. But still, uh, if we just compromise with a level of 100 milligrams, that should be sufficient. And if the patient cannot do it, so it's, it's difficult. It was necessary, but it's difficult. So you can use diuretics to try to promote some loss of sodium and, and also enhance the, the rise blockade effects. Um, protein restriction is important for um, you know, prevention or progression of CKD or diabetic kidney disease. Uh, in this study on type 1 diabetics, as you can see, um, the protein restriction slowed the decline of GFR. Um, basically, also in, in another study, it was shown that even protein restriction reduced the incidence of there and end stage. So it looked very magical, but actually what happened is that indeed the person restriction was not achieved in the study. It's just uh, because also the patient received good glycemic control, blood pressure management, and the proteinuria was managed aggressive. So it was probably the whole therapy that caused that benefit. But still, it is beneficial. So the problem with diabetics compared to other CKDs is that they, they are easily becoming malnourished with protein restriction. So you need to probably involve the dietitian and be more careful with your prescription. So let's talk about multifactorial therapy. That basically involves glycemic control, hypertension, the lipidemia, and any other little thing that you can find abnormally in your patient, like uric acid, et cetera. The look ahead trial showed that diabetic patients randomized to multifactorial lifestyle measure, like diet, exercise, versus a poor education, had a slower progression of CKD. But you're, you're comparing, a, it's like telling a patient, uh, you know, you should go and improve your diet, do exercise, or just saying you can do it. Obviously, if, you, if the patient doesn't take action, it's not going to work. So that's why I'm not surprised of this result. But actually, you should tell the patient to do this, and the patient should do it, and then you morally support him. Yes, you can do it, you believe in the patient. So you need to do both things together. So that's why if you compare them, it's just comparing just the good thought with, with action, yeah? So, but combination therapy in this uh, study, would, a small study in type one diabetes, you know, um, in the, it was with intensive insulin, protein restriction, use of ACE to lower the blood pressure to this level. At three years, actually the GFR of these patients increased and the albuminuria reduced. There is also the STENO type two trial. I'm going to talk in more details about this trial. It was 160 patients with moderately increased albuminuria assigned to standard care or multifactorial intensive therapy. What was that therapy? It was behavioral therapy, plus diet, exercise, smoking cessation, drugs, 
like ACE, aspirin, and extreme metabolic control of you know, glycemia and dyslipidemia. Basically focusing on everything, as we should, yeah? So the primary outcome was progression to vernal nephropathy or even cardiovascular outcomes. At a median time of 7.8 years, the intensive therapy reduced microvascular and microvascular disease. Albuminuria was reduced. The progression to ovarian nephropathy also reduced. And at the end of the trial, the patients were offered to continue with the intensive therapy. And after 20 years, those patients that continue with this, in, initiated with intensive therapy, continue with it, they have more benefits that the patients that work on the standard care and later convert to intensive therapy. This could be a reflection of simply, it was a length, it's a dose effect, they received the benefit for a longer period, or maybe that glycemic memory that some people talk about, because in the beginning of the disease, the glycemic control was not that good, later kind of accustomed to those high levels, more difficult to bring down the disease either, but indeed, if you start earlier, whatever measure you uh, advise your patient is more beneficial in the long run. And we care about the long run, no? For whatever reason, for people who wants to become a uh, singer or people who wants to come for this conference or want to see the grandchildren, for whatever is the reason of the patient, we focus in, in, the, in better outcomes to live as long as possible but as better as possible, yeah? So, Let's talk a little bit about cardiovascular risk reduction because it's one of the things that many trials are focusing on. And it's, it's very important. It's very important and because no one wants to have a heart attack and everyone wants to live as long as possible, living well, yeah? But the problem with that, the causation is multifactorial and very complex and we don't understand it yet fully. We know that diabetes, hypertension, epidemia, smoking, mineral bone disease, anemia, hypervolemia, and many, many other factors are implicated in cardiovascular risk factors. The same goes for death. So when a trial is properly designed, as you know, by scientific method, you need to just isolate one variable to see if that variable has got effect. So it's very difficult to test many things at the same time. But indeed, many of the trials probably just focusing on one single medication of this lipidemia, you asking them to counterattack all the other factors and show you cardiovascular risk benefit, sometimes it's very difficult. So many of the drugs might be beneficial in other ways, but just maybe because the focus is hard outcomes, which is very important, maybe you are not giving good service to that drug. So because life is more complex than that. And in real life, we don't just give them the patient this specific drug, like in a trial, and hoping all the other aspects of the of the his health or her her health are improved. So we give them anti uric acid medications, anti epidemic, diet advice for everything. We tell them to stop smoking, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So this is what we do in in real life. So, but indeed for research, you need to isolate, but also. So maybe it depends on how that hypothesis was generated. So are we really asking the correct question? Are we going through the correct outcome in the correct way? So not that the question of looking for the hard outcomes, it might be wrong, but maybe we're not doing it in the correct direction, yeah? What we can do is what we do in the clinic for diabetes, improve glycemic control, hypertension, try to achieve the target, use diet uh, statins, tell him to stop uh, smoking, control the, the phosphate, IPTH, correct the anemia, that the patient is eulemic, et cetera. Whatever is wrong in the patient, you try to improve it, the patient will receive the benefits. So I started my talk with this statement that the dose of dialysis to keep a patient alive for one year is not the same dose to keep him well for one year. So I hope that you understand why I made this statement and this applies to dialysis, applies, as you can see, to, to diabetic kidney disease, applies to many aspects of medicine, or even life. It's not the same dose of kindness, love you can give to, to your family, to people, and the benefit you will receive is greater if it's greater as well, yeah? So 
this is the end of my presentation. So if anyone has got any talk, comment, or any sort of um, different opinion, or wants to present yes. um, data for a trial that has So because this one, um, they act in different time points. For example, the basal insulin just give you the insulin all the time. You need intracellular insulin all the time. But then for the peaks, you need something that acts like the BPD4 that the, the impotent effect, they increase the impotent effect. So they reduce the peaks. And then, um, you know, all those medications that you say, the agonists as well, also reduce these peaks. So that's why is, uh, what I do with my patients, I measure the profile. If I see that the, one of the things that the patient has is that it's just like the, the blood, the median is too high up, maybe additional insulin, maybe he just requires a little bit of, of insulin or more insulin. But if I see the problem is mainly the peaks, treating, uh, treating these drugs, plus showing the patient that maybe needs to manipulate her diet on those time points, let's say breakfast is fine, or lunch goes high peak, it's probably when uh, you need to focus also on trying to bring down the glycemic load on the patient at that point. But yes, combination of drug those are important. Sometimes I have one patient that uh, was on mixed up, uh, you know, there was high hyperglycemic, with that yet we managed to bring down a little bit the peaks, but eventually he benefited from having baseline the basal insulin, and then <coughs> on the peaks, just give him some rapid insulin. So you can play with the combinations. And one of the things that is now important, uh, for example, you can choose, if you see the profile, the LDP also, if the patient, uh, let's say, has got a lot of um, uh, down phenomenon, the, the sugar is higher in the, in, in, in the first part of the day, maybe he will benefit from metformin, so to try to, you know, reduce the, the, the synthesis of, um, of glucose and glucogenesis. So I don't know if I answered correctly your question, sir. Or you want to add something no, from your experience you. or from Thank this you. paper? Thank you. 
Actually, we, we don't see so much lactic acidosis because we are even more cautious than these figures. So that's why I told you, I, even I presented this data, it was, it was presented on, on, the, on this conference, <coughs> it's a clever study. It gives you opportunity to, to use metformin for, with a more pure majority of the lactate. But in a way, we are still, overall we are more cautious. We don't go to CKD4 and many, for example, uh, GPs in Singapore, when the EFR increases below 60, they also uh, stop it because of there are some other recommendations that below 60. So in a way, we don't see it so often because we are also stopping it much earlier than these figures. Well, sorry, in that case, uh, you are also uh, encouraging the CKD three or? No, SS3 can do it. So in practice, you can practice, you are not giving it, but yeah. in theory, it can be given. It can be given in theory. Yeah. And my answer to that question is, if you know those principles, you know what can cause the metformin, you know the lactate, and especially if you have access to measuring lactate and you are going to do it, you can go that way. But if not, uh, maybe just play a cautious way or refer to the nephrologist for a quick report. In, in, my, in, my, in the way I would do it in my practice is I expose the question to the patient. If the patient is able to do this monitoring of lactate, Enter kind of that sub study. Yeah. I will just go to CKD 3D, not to CKD 4. If the patient wants to do it, if the patient decides not to, and I think there's a high risk, then probably I want to start. I don't think I want to add, even that the GFR, we think all, all the time the patients are stable, but sometimes if you, if we tell the patient, if you become ill for something else, if you get infection or a diarrhea, can become dehydrated, whatever. Maybe the stop the metformin or communicate with us. So when the situation changes, uh, you could need to review the, the, the prescription. So I have two, two questions. Yes. One, uh, is it possible that uh, we know potulinia, diuretic in disease can happen? One. Number two, are you in the opinion of using combination of acid and ARD in diuretic potulinia that is diuretic? Yeah. Okay. So supposedly it's, it's possible because one of the markers is GFR. Every patient is different. So there might be the patient is more susceptible, maybe some polymorphism of the uh, range receptors or things they won't understand. And maybe the the, the right. arterioles are more affected and ischemia cause more uh, you know tubular artificial disease. So it's possible. But typically, as a continuity, it's a very common. So that's my my impression, yeah? Um, but it's more opinion-based. So now, the, the question on the jewel, I didn't present it in, in this talk, but I, in the previous one. So indeed, for example, up to date, just uh, suggest not to do it. The, the GNC, JNC also suggests not to do it. Uh, in my experience, indeed, you know, potassium becomes an issue, so that's one of the issues. For many studies that show that it's not only potassium, it's acute kidney injury, hospitalization, so now you just have this rough pressure tablet and the patient end up hospitalized. Um, so it's, it's a high risk, but indeed, the combination is able to reduce proteinuria better, yeah? Especially if you use like, uh, you know, as the normal tone, so it's the combination is also good for the proteinuria, but you are causing other problems. Proteinuria is not the only thing. It's indeed, uh, it's toxic, but it's also a marker of disease. So how much are we chasing one or the other, we don't know yet. It's beneficial to reduce proteinuria, but you have other alternatives that, you know, you can use the uh, lactic channel blocker, like the lapamil, together with ACE inhibitors, and the benefit is as good as probably a combination without the, the risk of hypotalemia or injury. But I also found a pa another paper that uh, also say you can do it, if you think it's beneficial for that patient to reduce the proteinuria, you can do it also with correct monitoring of the patient's hypotalemia. And if the patient develops hypotalemia and you still is receiving the benefit, that it is not going off or anything like that, you could potentially continue it with low potassium diet, you know, using other diuretics to calibrate it for 
or uh, hypercalemia, try to bring it as a safe level as possible with good education of patient, if something changes, you know, uh, you, you need to, you know, to let us know, for example, uh, skin disease, more frequent probably uh, appointment. So it can be done, but uh, overall, my, you do it and you know what to do and you still put for it standard, but because you know, the up to date strongly you will say no, GMC, so lying in a, in a, if a problem occurs, it will get a bit awkward to, to, to defend it if, because maybe one person will say, you know, the GMC tell you this, of the tell you this. Uh, so it's a, a little bit, unless, but at the end the answer goes to informed consent, you know? If you discuss properly with the patient, the pros and cons, knowing that this is contradictory data or advice, but still you believe that it's the best for your patient and you can monitor and counter-arrest the hyperkalemia, or you think it's a low risk for progressive kidney disorder, you can potentially do it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Thank you, Dr. Ocampo, for your very nice and innovative presentation. Thank you. I have a question regarding the dysuteremia. Yeah. <laughs> So, indeed, obviously, uh, you can try to do it, but you know, with the immunosia part, the risk for you know rhabdomyolysis is more common if you use a combination. So, I'm a little bit cautious, but at the, at the end, you can go with the same principle: informed consent, monitoring the patient, the CK symptoms. You think is the best for the patient, you can still do it, but as the GFR goes lower, it's more likely that you can develop these complications. So. I, I tend to be more cautious. Well, I'm also a little bit biased because uh, I have also a kind of weight loss program in which is more diet based. So I always try all my efforts to try to bring down all these parameters with diet. And then if not, try to minimize, also minimize the use of, of medications for the side effects, especially when the GFR goes low. So it can be used, but you, you might encounter more complications, but at the end you also can consent proper monitoring uh, or use of other alternatives, yeah. And what was the question about the, the, the um, uh, anemia? The correction of anemia. Yeah. Regarding the uh, control of uh, progression of chicken. Yeah, um, I think if you I just go with the recommendations, hemoglobin tend to, to, to 11.5. So it's, it's important, but it's not going to, Anemia is not the only problem. And probably all these are more important than anemia. You will correct it for all the other benefits, but it's not that the quality of anemia is going to, you know, make everything that is off the scale uh, better. So you just need to correct it, focusing on the recommendation 10, 11.5, and uh, just following the, the same guidelines. I, I don't know, you, you know something more about Benefit. Yeah. 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 It's one of the factors, as I told you, the multifactorial therapy, one of the things you should focus. Whatever is abnormal, patient is sad, you try also to address the sadness, whatever, because it is a whole individual, no? it's, it's soul, mind, heart, everything. Diabetes affected everything, and affects the family, affects everything. So, any other question? Oh, okay. Oh, okay. Well, okay. Question, only question, only, only from the urologist. You know, oh, that would be whether you can, it's very nice lecture and I yeah, appreciate, yeah, accept yeah, my appreciation, yeah, please. Yeah, Most of the time we are taking patients of nephrology or kidney failure, so it's a little bit of intervention. 
the drugs which have been started where the urine, the glucose is used through, lost through the kidney, they lead to infection, urinary tract infection, like DPS, which drugs I don't know. And they lead to, uh, you know, have UTIs and increase in diabetes. And at the same time, there are no post diabetes, which is very highly known in older age. Men's. Yeah, that's right. That's okay. And uh, another thing, we uh, most of the physicians they don't advise uh, investigation on estimation of sodium. Whenever we take a patient, we want to ask for the strict patient for surgical intervention. He's always in hyponatremia. So this is my observation that he should be under observation that there is no hyponatremia while you are restricting the salt because it hinders the surgical intervention, number one, takes a lot of time and to correct it. And secondly, whenever you prescribe the drugs which are throwing the glucose in the urine, it gets uh, infected and it can increase the diabetes mellitus and can lead yeah. to melanopause. Yeah. No, that's true. I mean, we don't want to report the complications of yes. disease, either uh, urine infections or candida infections, especially in females. Yeah. Is and most of the time we do circumcision in these patients, you know, which is, which is can be avoided by telling them not to, uh, I mean, uh, take uh, precautions for cleaning and everything and uh, yeah. that. So, yeah, actually, just uh, an important uh, comment. I didn't go into the details, just want to explain you about the, the issues of the GFR and the use of these drugs. But indeed, that's an important comment. And I was the hypodatremia. At the end, it's like, you always take a baseline, you know, uh, you know, Values, no, it's indeed the patient that has already low sodium because they've been losing it or not eating it properly, and if you limit it, don't eat it. So, only you probably don't need to restrict the patient. Think it's on. a chronic one. Yeah. You know, patients yeah. are living on sodium 120, 121, or 119, and they, they don't do any symptoms. Yeah. It is only diagnosed when you have a surgical intervention, yeah. otherwise, okay. they are living on uh, hypothetical. Yeah. In, in, in Singapore, probably uh, that can happen, right. but I think because there are there's a uh, system of GPs and go frequently to the doctor. Also, patients tend to, uh, you know, to go for the monitor. Monitoring is there. So in yeah, a way, probably the, this chronic uh, hyponatremia is less often in, in, in Singapore. But indeed, if you identify the chronic, you will need to investigate, you will need to treat. So it's, uh, unfortunately, you discover when you go for surgery. But in a way, uh, if we discover in, in a walking patient, usually the GP will refer to is a little bit to something, so like if the patient is a, a, a surgery, so if we need to identify the thing before right Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you uh, for the nice presentation because of we have a lot of questions for you, Dr. Francisco, but <coughs> a very nice topic. But maybe later we need uh, to know about uh, the knowledge about the, the uh, diabetes patients and the drugs given. It can uh, reduce the GFR patient or not the diabetic uh, uh, drug given because of one of my uh, PhD uh, college doing this research and what happened? The GFR reduced for this uh, uh, drugs given like metformin. And, so on. So maybe for the further uh, conference, we have to uh, explore about this, not just a drug given, and how impact after 10 years and 20 years or 15 years after that. Okay, thank you for the nice presentation. And now uh, I'm going to give the certificate of recognition to Dr.